all right uh, am i audible to you everyone can you just uh, one of you speak if you can hear me clearly see the slides Yes, okay. sir. Excellent. So this is where we uh, stopped yesterday. We said that the demand for uh, coal, natural gas, and oil, which we club together as uh, as fossil fuels, are increasing day by day. And the second thing that we have said. that the other uh, unconventional sources for example or renewable sources for example nuclear or hydroelectricity actually uh, has a very uh, less significant proportion in the whole budget that we essentially require for mankind okay and uh, so this will not be enough to actually meet the demand uh, in near future so that is where we stop uh, in the last class and let's uh, take the journey forward we will spend uh, some more uh, some more slides uh, in explaining the importance of 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 petroleum industry petroleum geology as such and then we will get into the uh, actual technicality of the of, of the subject okay so what you see in this particular slide is uh, the fuel usage okay so if we look at around 1850s okay in the year of 1850s the primary source of energy was essentially by wood burning people used to uh, burn wood and then they used to get um, get whatever energy they used to need you know so there was no coal there was no electricity there was no fuel okay in 1950s however 100 years later we can see that there is a big switch to fossil fuels it complete more use of so sorry in 1900 of course wood and coal use is about equal okay easy transition to make because both were solid fuels right so 1900s people have already discovered uh, coal and they knew how to use coal okay and because wood also is a, is a solid Uh, fuel and uh, coal is a solid fuel as well it was very easy for them to make that transition okay and then of course uh, oil was just starting to show up yeah oil was just starting to show up liquid need to change uh, the furnace technology so the way you can actually burn or make combustion with coal or wood it will not be the same for oil right oil is liquid so there was necessity of the change in technology so in within 1950s what people see there is a big switch to fossil fuel is complete more use of liquid and gaseous fuels that means oil and gas and very little use of renewable fuels or nuclear so within 1950s as well we were heavily dependent on oil and gas and coal of course okay in 1990s oil is now the dominant fuel type of course we know that followed by natural gas and coal more use of alternative fuels and nuclear that is what is happening nowadays wood is primarily used in the third world nations right so say for example in africa some of the villages maybe or some of the villages in india itself you might find people actually using wood to actually uh, cooking or uh, some domestic purposes otherwise nobody uses uh, wood for any other purpose right so we are heavily dependent right now on oil and gas we have started begin our journey in 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 the in case of solar wind uh, biofuels hydroelectricity all of them are right now coming up okay if you now compare the situation this is uh, essentially the, in this in this particular pie chart you can see the percentage that is being taken by oil and then that is by being taken by coal um Uh, this is natural gas and other means it includes hydroelectricity wind solar uh, and everything but day by day of course this the, the proportion of the of the other which is the alternative source of energy is increasing but as i said it is still not enough right 
Now, <clears throat> these fossil fuels, be it coal, be it oil, be it gas, it has its uh, inherent disadvantages. So if you burn something which has inherently carbon, what happens? As a, as a byproduct, it releases carbon dioxide. And we all know what is the effect of carbon dioxide on our atmosphere. It is a uh, uh, dominantly a uh, greenhouse gas, and it increases the temperature of the, of the atmosphere. Uh, global warming takes place. Uh, the, the air pollution is there. And I don't have to explain what are the uh, demerits of having higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the paper that I had sent you in my previous email, you can also read about um, the adverse effects of carbon dioxide that is uh, currently present in our society, right? So this is what you see. Of course, the, the excessive carbon dioxide, whatever comes in the atmosphere, is, uh, is attributed by the burning of fossil fuel, either in the industry or in the car or in the domestic purposes, wherever it is, okay? So this is primarily attributed by the burning or combustion of the fossil fuel, right? So you can see uh, how different countries are essentially contributing to the total carbon dioxide budget. Okay, so India is not uh, not as significant as China or or USA. Okay, but India also uh, contributes to that greenhouse. I mean, carbon dioxide budget of the world it's around six percent. Okay, it's not 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 very not not very promising as well. So we we burn a lot of fossil fuels and uh, emit carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? So. If you think about it, there is a natural um, carbon cycle. I think you have all read about it about it in your um, introduction to environmental science course. But there is a natural carbon cycle. What happens? You know, uh, the carbon dioxide is released in the atmosphere, and then it gets entrapped in the carbonate rocks through the sea. Yeah, and then again, uh, uh, it, it it again goes back to the atmosphere. So there is a there is a carbon cycle, right? Now that carbon cycle essentially maintains the balance, right? But then that balance is essentially disturbed by our anthropogenic activities, that is by means of burning fossil fuels, right? So that is something what we need to be very um, cautious about as um, citizens of the world or uh, as scientists, if you like, that we have to uh, find the balance where we progress in our society as well. And that seems to be very unnatural without burning fossil fuels at this point in time. But we have to be very careful that we do it in a very clean way so that uh, we can somehow uh, retain this uh, or refrain this uh, carbon dioxide not to be spread in the atmosphere. Okay? So that is, uh, and that is all about carbon capture and storage. Uh, carbon sequestration, all sorts of technologies which are coming up is around that aspect of the of the theme. Okay, so now this is where we are currently. If you think in a, this is like a very philosophical slide, you know, we are uh, we as people in a kind of a chain or kind of in a cycle which interacts with water, energy, and uh, we are heavily dependent on plants and other life. Okay, so. Uh, and of course, you know, we are very much, very much intermingled with the, with the climate. We live uh, because the climate is there. It has its, its effects, of course, but then we have direct contribution in terms of affecting the climate as well. Okay. So we, we cannot live without energy. And then as a byproduct, we do uh, emit uh, the, as a byproduct of the consumption of the, of the uh, fossil fuels, we do emit greenhouse gases, which in terms affects the climate. So there is kind of a chain, uh, and there is a cycle uh, whose center point is us, you know. And we can, uh, we are the first uh, generation of people, if you like, you know, we have who has the capacity to kind of uh, influence this cycle and uh, go towards sustainable development. Okay, so we we can't stop the development of the society, of course. Uh, but then we have to be very careful that we do, it, do that in a very sustainable way. And sustainable development, uh, one of the theme of sustainable development is reducing greenhouse gases or maintaining the balance of greenhouse gases, if you like, okay, uh, amongst other pollutants that we 
um, like aerosols, like you know, particulate matters or whatever that we uh, pollute our uh, climate with. Okay, so that is something which we have to be extremely careful about. Okay, now let me uh, just spend uh, not more than five minutes to talk about a bit of history around petroleum industry. And then uh, we will get into the actual technical business. Okay. So now, prior to 1900, there was no petroleum geology. I mean, people used to use oil and gas, mostly oil, but that was uh, obtained generally not by a very scientific way. So you know about oil seepage that there are places where oil naturally comes up to the ground, okay, to faults and fractures. And people used to see such places. They used to dig around and maybe get some local, you know, uh, petroleum, uh, some some uh, sands which is soaked with petroleum, or maybe some pool of oil which they used to use very, you know, in a very domestic purposes because man is intelligent and they know that this particular thing burns, and then they used it. Okay, and such uses can be were reported from Appalachian, California, Baku. Uh, Pluseti, Peru, Egypt, Borneo, everywhere. Okay, but people did not uh, invest in oil and gas in a very scientific way. Okay, so the anticlinal theory was known, but was not used in practice. What is an anticlinal theory? Um, uh, I mean, the fourth year students, I think they they already know that uh, the anticlines, the structure anticline, actually uh, acts as a trap, right? As a as a trap to hydrocarbon. So people used to know if you can find something like which is which looks like a dome, you might expect uh, that oil and gas is below that. Okay, but uh, that's about it. They did not know the science behind it, but uh, also they did not practice that. Okay, many fields located in so-called geomorphic traps. Okay, we will talk about what are geomorphic traps. The first break oil uh, well was. Uh, um first the first oil is oil well was drilled which is called the drake well in 1859 that was in pennsylvania and that is essentially the start of um the very big oil and gas industry that you see today okay from 1900 to 1924 anticlinal theory was put in practice mostly in uh, spindle top in texas and you can see i don't know if you have seen Pictures of that those days in Texas, it, the whole area was um, kind of ornamented. I mean, um, flooded with all rigs, one after another, one after another. Okay, so Texas was uh, the first place in in the U.S. where oil became a boom actually, and anticlinal theory was put into practice. Important discoveries like Lake uh, in, in in Venezuela, in Iran, and then in Trinidad, Borneo, Mexico, Oklahoma. Uh, California, all these places, people started making significant discoveries. So petroleum geology was uh, started from then, and uh, uh, the foundation of APG, American Association of Petroleum Geologists, that is still there, and you can be a uh, be a member, a student member. You can have a APG chapter in Isar Bhopal. Um, they are very. Uh, the other important organization is SPE. Society of Petroleum Engineers. So you can uh, have a student chapter in Isar Bhopal as well. They help you in organizing uh, seminars, calling up industry experts. Also, you can have uh, you know internship opportunities. That is something to look for if you if you are thinking of a career in oil industry. You know, uh, if there is a major, um, I mean, it, the, it's a good thing to have in the campus as well. So by the way, at this point in time, I want to also tell you that I have I am contacting different uh, oil and gas experts around the world, and many of them have agreed. So what we will do as we go with our uh, course, okay? Uh, as we go with our course, maybe I teach a chapter to you. I teach you the very basics, okay? Then I ask one of the experts to actually give a seminar of an maybe 40 minutes to one hour to you on that very topic. Um, and we will try to schedule that seminar on the three day, on Friday, okay? So um, don't worry, the things, I mean, uh, will not be essential in your exam, but it's a 
um, it's a very good way to uh, you know um, learn from the experts they are all um, renowned experts on different topics of 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 petroleum system of 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 the petroleum industry someone will talk about drilling someone will talk about uh, petrophysics someone will talk about reservoir modeling so i uh, the, the experts from shell keynes uh, ongc um, decker uges many of them have agreed so i will put together a plan yeah and uh, i i urge that you you actually uh, attend those seminars um i'll open that seminar also for the wider audience but then uh, yours presence will be a must okay so uh, please make sure that you um, attend those seminars okay and then um, of course so petroleum geology american association of petroleum geologists was established the bolivar coastal field was discovered first homoclinal trap we will discuss what homoclinal trap is later on but for the timing remember it's it it just have a single dip okay so it doesn't really form an form an anticline or something it just have a monotonous single dip direction and uh, traps were found there first offshore large heavy oil field was discovered okay so first offshore oil i mean uh, first in the sea so people have uh, so the people have ventured now from the onshore to the offshore okay 1925 to 1945 some very important discoveries in venezuela in in iraq kirkuk kirkuk field still produces actually okay numerous fields in middle east mostly also in carbonate so far people have been discovering oil and gas in the in the plastics that is sandstone and uh, uh, from then uh, 1925 to 1945 people have started discovering uh, carbonate fields as well uh with geochemistry people understood that scientists understood that oil is organic oil is not inorganic people used to think that this is some kind of uh, you know they did not know how oil generated right so uh, the science behind the generation of oil was put in place micro through micro paleontology through organic geochemistry we will see how later on technological breakthroughs that happened rotary drilling we will see what rotary drilling is later on rotary drilling is essentially earlier people used to do percussion drilling percussion drilling means there is there's this drilling bit and then you keep on pumping the ground i mean hammering the ground and try to make a hole it is difficult rotary drilling means the bit actually rotates okay and then you make a hole okay? so the technological breakthroughs are rotary drilling torsion balance gravimeter you know about gravimeter what it does i i i mean for the fourth year student i talked about gravimeter in your um, solid earth geophysics class class for third year student i will teach you later but what torsion balance gravimeter does it keeps your um, keeps your drill pipe in position okay so for example you want to hit something which is just below gopal um earlier days maybe you are you have started drilling in gopal your uh, at 3000 meter maybe you had you would have gone in somewhere near um, i don't know maybe in sachi okay so people the geo steering was not perfect so the torsion balance gravimeter gave us that flexibility to actually have a better um, control on on the drilling path reflection seismology came in place electrical well logs came in place what is reflection seismology what is electrical well logs we will see them you will see them twice the third year students of course very briefly in your uh, geophysics class as well and here in bit more details okay so wells till 3000 meter where it started to be being drilled 1945 to 1960 drilling boom okay this is the best place i, I mean uh, one of the best times to be in the oil industry discovery of major oil fields by the way this is the time by which wngc oil and natural gas corporation was established in india as well okay by the um, uh, by the britishers initially with the help of the britishers and then taken over by india okay uh and one important theory, one important thing to know uh, uh, ongc is one of the navaratan com companies of india i i hope you know uh and it has never seen loss in their lives okay 
this is the first time during the covid 19 ongc reported loss in their in one of their quarters okay so you can see how covid covid 19 impacted the one of the companies which never had seen loss uh, could uh, you know reported loss uh, this time okay so discovery of major oil fields in middle east usa western canada russian platform drilling depths went all the way up to 6000 meter uh, important insights into hydrocarbon migration and accumulation were found out. Sedimentology became one of the most important um, domains of, of, of petroleum geology. Offshore 1960 to 1980, offshore drilling technology developed. Discovery of North Sea, Libya, Nigeria, Siberia, Eastern Mexico provinces started to come. Subtle traps, so you will see what subtle traps are. I mean, the traps which are not very. Um, pronounced they are called subtle traps uh, came into existence vast improvement in the seismic acquisition and processing technology we'll see what are what is seismic acquisition what is seismic processing later on of course but overall there was a very technological i mean um, uh, almost a catastrophic shift in technology in terms of uh, um, oil and gas industry is concerned that happened between 1960 to 1980. Since 1980, passive margin plays have been discovered, huge carbonate fields have been discovered, 3D and 4D seismic uh, is now in place. Uh, the dynamic picture of the reservoir, which we call dynamic modeling, is, has come to come into place, leads to uh, seismic stratigraphy. We'll see what, what seismic stratigraphy is later. Integration of petroleum disciplines, computerized workflows, OK? So, so since 1980s, of course, the, the I mean, computer became uh, a household name, of course, and then um, oil industry was not uh, an exception. Um, the technology was picked up heavily by, by oil industry. Nowadays, I think this, this yeah, I have not prepared one slide, but then there should be another, uh, another slide which says about the effect of artificial intelligence. You might um, maybe when you give one of the seminars, one of you, one of you, one of the groups can take up this this topic. What is the how oil industry, oil and gas industry has taken up artificial intelligence in their workflow? Okay? And I can tell you, it is quite significant. Um, the effect of uh, I mean the incorporation of robotics and artificial intelligence has been really really robust in oil and gas industry as well. Okay, so. That brings me to the um, you know the story part of the of, of today's class and yesterday's class, and we will start with the actual business. Before we do that, let me hear if anyone has any question. Anyone, if you have a question, please please do not hesitate. Ask. Come on, uh, I have been told that uh, this is the way uh, the institute instructs that you give pre-recorded lecture and you keep the live sessions only for the interaction with the students. Okay, and then I see none of the students are interacting. You have nothing to say. No questions, nothing, no um, curiosity. And I have to pick people let's see there is no escape guys you know me anand anand esar can you unmute please anand can you unmute please No microphone. Wow. Is he? Is he? Uh, uh, you are not lying, right? Okay. I think that's that can be very. I can. I think that can be a very nice excuse of not interacting. And I don't have a microphone. Okay. Let's see. Let's see more third year students. Baby Smita, have I pronounced your name right? Yes. 
Yes, sir. Okay. So you have a, you have any question, Baby Smita? How do I, how people call you, Baby Smita? Yeah, Baby Smita. Okay. Okay, Smita, do you have any question? Or was everything clear? No, sir. Okay. Gaurab, Gaurab, Meena. Gaurab? Yes, sir. How are you? Fine, sir. Was it clear or uh, anything was uh, uh, you want me to repeat? Any clarification that you need? No, sir. No questions? No question, sir. Okay. Hitendra? Yes, sir. Anything Hello. you have to say? No, sir. No? Okay. Let's see. Minakshi? I think her microphone is also not working. Anyway, okay, but I'll not, uh, I'll interact again later on. Let's go ahead with the class. But please, guys, uh, I mean, otherwise, if you don't, interact it becomes very funny for me as well just to keep on speaking i don't i can't see your eyes whether you are you are understanding whether it is completely going off the track um, whether i am speaking fast whether i am speaking slow i don't exactly i'm not able to understand so my job is to um, is to convey the message convey the course in the most effective way so please interact uh, that will make my job a bit more easier okay Otherwise, it's also very boring for me to just keep on speaking with, uh, you know, in the same tone from the uh, first to begin. Yeah. Jay, you have something to say? Yes, sir. Like uh, yeah. every comparison was in based of the like the energy requirement uh, yeah. satisfied by coal and oil. So like mm -hmm. you said in the beginning that a lot of products are manufactured using petroleum and oil. Absolutely. So what percentage of oil extracted is used in the product manufacture compared to the energy requirement okay so right. that 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 depends on the density of the oil okay so there are some light oils for example you know which has a we will talk about light oils you know which are having very low api gravity where you can extract almost 90 percent of the of the oil as fuel okay so that thing that you can use directly maybe in an aeroplane you know but then there are heavy oils Heavy oils means impurities in them. For example, it has more wax. It has sometimes, say, for example, the um, oil that comes out from Barmer field in Rajasthan. Yeah, you can actually hold the oil in your hand. It's so heavy. So you can imagine maybe 10 to 20 percent of it actually comes as real fuel. Maybe 5, 10 to 20 percent maximum comes as real fuel, which you can use as a fuel per se. Okay. But the rest of it is the byproduct, which is generally used for um, all the other materials that you can uh, that you can use. But your primary oil aim will be, of course, if you have taken the um, crude oil out, to use it as fuel. So light oil is more expensive, and heavy oil is cheaper. Also, it involves another cost in case of heavy oil, that because you have to then crack the oil. You know, so what is cracking means the Processing of the oil. That means so the so the lighter oil requires less processing. You know you can um, almost use it directly uh, from the from the uh, as it is as crude. You know not directly. I'm I'm exaggerating. Maybe with very little uh, processing. I mean uh, post production processing um, as a fuel. Okay. But then if if the specific gravity of the oil is very high, then uh, it will be um, you know, um, it will be more cumbersome to um, to process it. Did it? Did I answer you rightly, Jay? Yes, sir. Okay. So it depends on the specific gravity. I have another question, sir. I have a question regarding future of oil. 
and petroleum industries considering covid situation affecting the future okay um, so if i understand your uh, question correctly what would happen to the industry right so i mean uh, it is anybody's case i mean do we also don't know what will happen to the to the, um, to the human species maybe day after tomorrow right it's uh, if so i can tell you let's let's put it in a, in a very philosophical way if the uh, human race survives and if it thrives again you will require energy okay and if you require energy of course you have to have source of energy and we are right now not in a place to um, meet the demand of the human kind with uh, the renewable energies of course so i can see if this whenever i mean uh, um, you can see that uh, it's still like 40 50 dollars 60 dollars per barrel even after the covid situation uh, we see uh, oil prices okay so um, yeah the the situation is not great but it's not very green either so uh, as long as people are there as long as you have to you know you need electricity as long as you need um, your air conditioning maybe in the uh, western countries you need, need heating system in your um, at your home as long as you need energy uh, oil and gas industry will be there un until you have a complete shift in the uh, energy domain in terms of uh, solar cell or um, you know solar cell mostly comes in into play or nuclear comes into play otherwise you still have a future so uh, there is a if you ask me in that way that um, can i expect a job in the oil industry yes you very much can okay not in, in your lifetime i'm sure uh, oil industry will still be there and uh, maybe try again okay so we have to wait till the covid situation becomes better any other question Okay, so then let's uh, proceed. So now we will get into the actual technical part of the course. But you know, as I said, this is not a basic course. We will keep on moving back and forth with some economic um, aspects of the of, of oil and gas, some technological aspects of oil and gas. Okay. So don't expect to only read geology throughout the course, okay? And this is not how the course is meant to be as well, okay? All right. So if we, where do I find oil and gas? You know, we might have some, some vague idea that this is underground. Underground where? Underground in some rocks. And which type of rocks can can actually um, store hydrocarbon? Yeah, store oil and gas. So oil and gas. I'll, I'll if I refer to hydrocarbon, that is more of an umbrella term, you know. So that re, that um, includes both oil and gas, right? So this is stored in some sort of rock which has porosity okay let me just uh, before i show you that picture let me just draw a few things for you so oil or gas I don't know, this is strange. Just a moment, guys. I'll just try to figure out what is happening. Okay. So, oil or gas. Can you see my whiteboard, everyone? Yeah. 
yes okay excellent so we will call them together as hydro carbon and that comes from chemistry of course you know so if you look at any oil or gas you will find we will see the chemistry uh, of oil and gas later on it of course has hydrogen ion and carbon ion so hence we call them as hydrocarbon hydro comes from hydrogen carbon is carbon right now so if we think about it hydrocarbon is produced if i just tell you about the story is produced from so hydrocarbon is produced from organic matter rich shell okay. and that is what we call as source rock okay. organic matter rich shell how does this organic matter rich shell actually get generated as you know you know how how do shell uh, shell uh, gets deposited you know so shell is a very so if i if i look at shell shell is a very fine grained rock right okay and you have seen that shell also has a lot of mica in it and it has sio2 of course silica yeah there may be some aluminosilicate minerals and of course it has organic matter at the very bottom of a basin yeah shell gets deposited in a calm and quiet low energy environment okay i hope you know about these things from your sedimentology class calm and quiet low energy environment that is what you required for the deposition of shell right so if the if it is a very high energy environment you don't sorry you don't you don't essentially uh, deposit shell okay so now i have a shell layer and generally shell is marked like this it is marked like this and then this shell layer gets of course uh, shell layer of course gets from happening is is provided to high i do come on i'll figure it out in uh, because this is something that i am using uh, recently hence i am not very not always very uh, efficient in using it this whiteboard stuff but hopefully i will i will get there soon so you provide pressure and temperature to this shell okay so you know of course if you want to put pressure and temperature to shell what do you have to do you have to bury the shell under some rock okay so now this this shell is buried i 
I wrote buried. It. This shell is buried. And then it, it is being affected by pressure and temperature. And once you subject the shell to some pressure and temperature, what happens? Hydrocarbon essentially cracks. Hydrocarbon comes up, expels out, and then it gets stored in some other rock, which we call as reservoir. Okay? And this reservoir rock will be capped by another low permeability rock. And then you will drill a well here okay, to take the oil and gas out. So this process of moving of the hydrocarbon from the shell to the reservoir is called migration. So now if I go back to the slide again, and this is a nice, nice representation, as you can see. So this is my shell layer, which is right now here. Of course, this was deposited very much in the surface in a very calm and quiet environment. And this shell layer is having enough TOC. Okay, So that the term we call as TOC. Yeah. Total organic carbon. Okay. So it will have enough that shell layer the shell layer will have enough EOC or total organic carbon. So this is a fundamental requirement for a shell layer to be an effective source rock. Okay? It must have enough POC. Okay? So, so this is my shell layer and uh, let us imagine that this is having enough TOC, enough total organic carbon. And then it is because of the burial. And as you know, as we move from, from the surface to the, to the bottom, the temperature essentially increases. And this is currently placed under a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So, or say around yeah 90 degree to 120 degree centigrade or so something like that so that is where this shell layer is and because this particular shell layer is at that temperature for millions of years hydrocarbon expels out from this shell layer we will see how but it expels out for the time being remember it is it expels out from the shell layer and then it migrates through faults or fractures up. Why does it migrate up? It migrates up simply because it is lighter than water. Okay? So it has specific gravity lower than water. So anything in the upper crust which has permeability, all the rocks which is in the upper crust which has permeability is filled with some sort of fluid. Okay. And primarily, that, that fluid is called brine or so that fluid primarily is called brine. So anything which you, you, so this is your top surface, of course. And anything, any rock which is permeable and porous is filled with primarily Brine. Yeah. And brine is nothing but 
salt saturated water salt saturated water it can be completely saturated it can be um, you know a little uh, little less saturated but it is saturated with salt okay so that is what we call as brine okay? and then of course if you if you think about it say for example from this is my shell layer and here i have expelled uh, hydrocarbon this is where I have expelled hydrocarbon. So what will happen to the hydrocarbon? So this hydrocarbon, this is lighter than water, right? So this is lighter than water. So if this is lighter than water, what will happen? This will move up yeah, because of its lower specific gravity, right? So hence, this is moving up. And this is what we call as migration. Now, look at this particular gray layer. Okay. And this gray layer is called the cap. Okay. And this cap layer is also not flat. You can see this cap layer is actually folded. And this configuration is called a trap. Now, let us try to think about it. Why do I need a cap rock and why do I need a trap? Okay. So let us say so this is my tail layer, so this is my source. And from here, I have got my hydrocarbon being spilled out. And this will keep on spilling or moving up if it doesn't find a cap rock. Okay. Now, say for example, it finds one rock, yeah, which is a sandstone and which has enough porosity and permeability. So what is porosity and what is permeability? We will discuss that later on. For the time being, we will discuss the mathematically later on. But for the time being, let us say porosity means, so these are my big grains in sand. These are my SiO2 quartz grains, maybe. And then this part is my void space, right? Between two grains. So this is my porosity. Not only that, these porous spaces are connected to each other, right? They are connected to each other as you can see yeah. so this connectedness within the porosity we call it as permeability now this oil essentially finds this porous or permeable layer and then it finds immediately at the top of this porous and permeable layer it finds a layer which has very low porosity and permeability. So this layer, so shell has very low porosity and permeability. It finds another shell layer, yeah, which also has very low porosity. We will call it as phi and permeability, we we'll call it as k. Okay? Very low porosity and permeability. So what will happen to this? oil and gas let us so the oil and gas what we'll do it will find its space in this border space and it will move laterally it was moving it was moving 
this direction vertically now it will move laterally and then there will be a place when this shell layer will stop because it cannot run for infinite times will stop and then again it will move up right getting my point and suppose here is my ground surface okay. here is my ground surface and then this will leak at the ground surface so this is what we call as oil seepage right it will leak at the ground surface okay. so now if i drill so say for example this happened around 50 million years ago okay and it created hydrocarbon it went it migrated it slipped maybe for last 50 my million years it has been sipping and now if i drill a well here would i find any hydrocarbon tell me would i find any hydrocarbon no it will it will vanish it will go away from the system right so what we will need or oh, you have not studied sedimentology that's fine but i will i i know i i'm sure you know about shale and sandstone right or not in your uh, es 101 the first introduction to earth science you studied about a little bit of uh, sedimentology i'm sure introduction to sedimentology you know what is shale what is sandstone i'm sure so if we keep on doing that discussion we will not find any hydrocarbon because it has all migrated out okay. so what that what is this cap rock so this is what we call as cap rock this is what we call as reservoir and this is what we call as source yeah so if i have a flat cap rock if i have a flat reservoir I will not be able to retain my hydrocarbon. On the other hand, say for example, I have a beautiful structure here. Say for example, I have a fold. Okay, so my cap rock is folded. So this is my cap rock. And here is my reservoir that is also folded. This is a reservoir. So it has my porosity and permeability. now if the hydrocarbon comes so hydrocarbon is moving up okay it found it here then it is laterally migrating migrating this way it's migrating this way okay it's migrating this way yeah. but then there will be some that might go away but then a larger portion of it will be trapped here. Now, if I drill a well, I will be able to take that hydrocarbon out, right? So here, so here, not only I have a cap rock, I also have a trap present here. And of course, I have a source rock here as well. So here is my source rock. Source. So if I now essentially try to explain that with this, with the help of this particular cartoon. So the elements that I need to have, the must have in an active petroleum system is the presence of a source rock, the presence of a reservoir rock the presence of a cap rock the presence of a trap there must be a migration pathway what does migration pathway means that this uh, hydrocarbon whatever we generate from here must migrate from here 
I mean, it must find a way to migrate from the source rock to the reservoir rock through some faults or fractures. Okay? So it must, must find that migration pathway. And then there is something called timing. I'll just spend one minute with timing and then I'll end the class and we will talk about uh, timing later on uh, with even more detail. Say, for example, when the source rock was generated and the hydrocarbon expelled, maybe that happened before 120 million years. Okay? That happened before 120 million years. Now, the reservoir and the trap came after 50 million years. So, before the trap actually could form, all the hydrocarbon that were generated completely sipped away. Okay? So, it is very important that it starts the, mig the migration when I already have a trap in place. If the timing of the trap is later than the hydrocarbon migration, I will also not be able to <coughs> preserve my hydrocarbon within that trapping system. Okay? So, the timing is also very important. And the last thing is maturation. So, as I said that it, it goes for a specific set of temperature that this shell rock has to go through to expel hydrocarbon. If it is lower than that temperature, we will talk about it in, a, in greater detail. If it is lower than that temperature, what will happen? We will not be able to create any hydrocarbon. The source rock will be undercooked. Okay? And if it is more than that, if it is more than that temperature, what will happen? It will overcook or it will burn the source rock. So the hydrocarbon will not be there. It's simply like cooking. If you are using low temperature, your cooking will not be complete. If you are using very high temperature, then your food will be burned. Okay, so you have to use a very particular type of temperature to actually create hydrocarbon from source rock. Now, then another important thing, say for example, I'll ask you this question now. Uh, you have to answer. Say, for example, I give you a piece of shell, okay? Organic rich shell. I can find it anywhere, everywhere. Okay, well, we can go for, for a field trip and I can collect a piece of shell for you, okay? And give it to you and then ask that um, Shivangi, I give you that shell and I ask you that I will give you the full laboratory with all pressure temperature conditions and I'll ask you that can you, you know, Cook the shell in laboratory, you know, and create hydrocarbon there. What do you think? Can we or can we not? So I give you the laboratory with proper pressure and temperature, okay? And I give you the source rock from where the hydrocarbon can be generated. Okay? Will you be able to cook hydrocarbon from there or not? Yes or no? I'll answer Jitendra your question. Just let me get this one first. Can we can we create hydrocarbon from that source rock with enough pressure and temperature? I, I think theoretically, yes, right? So because pressure, temperature, and timing works in like a um, uh, in a very proportionate way. So maybe a particular temperature given for some years in the laboratory, maybe I will be able to create hydrocarbon. And believe me, people have tried creating this as well, but it doesn't work. Okay? So it needs to be that slow cooking, you know, biryani, slow cooking biryani happens for like um, hours and then you get the beautiful biryani coming out of tandoor. Okay, it's similar to that. So you have to, but here the time scale is slightly larger millions of years okay so you have to keep that shell for millions of years in inside the earth in that particular temperature then only the shell cracks hydrocarbon which essentially migrates to the fault and fracture system to a reservoir rock and gets capped by the uh, impermeable shell and then you can actually penetrate through the shell with a well and take the hydrocarbon out
ओके सो व्हाट इज योर क्वेश्चन जितेंद्र कैन वी ट्रैक द कैप रॉक और पेट्रोलियम फील्ड ये एब्सोल्युटली एंड दैट्स व्हाट वी विल वी विल लर्न हाउ कैन यू एक्चुअली सी दैट कैप रॉक हाउ डू वी नो वेयर द कैप रॉक इज वेयर दैट रिजर्वर इज दैट व्हाट डेप्थ बिकॉज़ वी कांट सी इट फ्रॉम द टॉप from the top it's just i mean it's the ground surface it's lying somewhere below 3000 meter and hence we will need technology yeah when we will talk about those technologies that how we can track those cap rocks and the um, reservoir rocks where exactly at what dip that uh, cap rock is there you will be able to calculate how much hydrocarbon is there what is the volume of hydrocarbon that is present there and so on and so forth everything you will calculate porosity calculate permeability everything from different uh, geophysical techniques which we will learn in this particular course any other question that anyone have anyone else any other question okay if not then i will uh, um close the session today on friday i will uh, um upload a upload a lecture okay um yeah so i'll continue with the same theme and i will upload the lecture and then on monday then uh, sorry yeah on monday itself when uh, we have again live interaction that is the time i'll take questions from you meanwhile while you see the videos uh, i hope you have all subscribed to the channel because i'm not going to send an email every time i upload a video uh, to all of you uh, just please look at the video okay if you subscribe you will see just go to the channel and you will see the video uploaded i do that immediately after the class if not sometime today or tomorrow i'll do it and friday i will upload another uh, another video with the same continuation of the lecture and answer questions up Uh, in uh, on monday's class but if you have a burning question you can also write to me yeah you can write in that whatsapp group or in the or in the email instead of instead of open fold if the fold is tight will it be will it be change in the amount of hydrocarbon absolutely neeraj it will change i mean uh, the openness of the fold essentially will control the volume of hydrocarbon that Uh, that is there okay so if we, if i have a very tight fold of course with the same configuration in, the, in a tight fold the number of um although the fill point the point from where hydrocarbon expels goes down but overall the volume will be reduced that is true or if you have any other questions you can still write to me you can uh, post it on uh, in a mail or uh, or in the whatsapp group and i can get back to you can we say the maximum holding of reservoir rock depends on porosity and permeability absolutely Perm well it's morely por more porosity but permeability essentially determines how uh, flowable that reservoir unit is yeah so porosity and uh, we will see what uh, the total holding capacity depends on so it depends on few things as you have asked but we will cover that point it depends on porosity it depends on gross rock volume the total volume of the rock itself it depends on the hydrocarbon saturation what if we will see that the all the pore spaces will not be filled with only hydrocarbon there will be some part of it which will also be filled with water okay so some percentage of it will be filled with hydrocarbon so hydrocarbon saturation yeah um and then the total reservoir rock will not be completely 100% sandstone it some part of will be sandstone some part will be silt so there will be uh, uh, there is something another thing we multiply it with we call it net to gross okay so how much is actually the net reservoir in the whole reserve in the gross reservoir so that we need to multiply as well so these are the few parameters on which the total held holding capacity of a reservoir rock essentially depends and the the holding capacity for oil we call it as coip i'll just uh, 
stock tank oil initially in place so now onwards i will expect nirul when you talk about the holding capacity you will use this words word stock okay stock means stock tank oil initially in place that essentially talks about the uh, holding capacity of a reservoir which has oil and this is called gip gip means gas initially in place if if the hydrocarbon the coal the uh, nature of hydrocarbon is gas we call it gip or gas initially in place okay yes so it depends on porosity net to gross and um, yeah the other factors that i just said gross stock volume um and hydrocarbon saturation anything else okay just answer me one question is the speed of teaching okay with you or uh, do i need to speak faster or do i need to speak slower is it is the speed okay anyone can answer please okay very good okay then i'll stop the stop the session here today uh and uh, i'll see you on uh, so for for geophysics people i'll see you tomorrow morning 10 am uh, for third year and uh, fourth year i will see and 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 the, for geology of wells i'll see you on on monday friday up to the lecture thank you guys bye